My name is Kent Bai, and I do the Voices of VR podcast. And today I'm going to be doing a tour and landscape of the XR moral dilemmas and ethical considerations. And I'm attempting to cover all of the XR ethical moral dilemmas within the next 15 to 20 minutes. And so it's pretty ambitious. I do have the slides available with lots of footnotes. I've been doing the Voices of VR podcast since 2014. And so I've recorded over 2,000 interviews and published over 1,200 of them, so just over two-thirds of them that I've recorded. And in the process of talking to a lot of folks within the XR community, there's naturally been a lot of different ethical and moral dilemmas. And so this is like a broad overview of the landscape of XR ethical and moral dilemmas. And so I'll be diving into each of these, but this is just to give you a bit of a sense of the landscape. And this actually takes me back to Laval Virtual back in 2019, where I was brought out to brainstorm with a group of folks some of the different ethical and moral dilemmas, and so we have lots of these post-it notes, and so we're struggling with how do we start to organize the whole landscape of all these different ethical and moral dilemmas. And so in SCVR in 2016, I had given a presentation trying to map out the ultimate potentials of virtual reality of all the different domains and industry verticals and potentials, and so I'd ask people at the end of every podcast, what's the ultimate potential of VR? And they'd say, well, it's education, it's entertainment, it's being able to connect with friends and family, it's empathy, it's doing stuff for your career. And so this was like a start of a cartography of the different domains of human experience, which ended up being very helpful for starting to map out these ethical and moral dilemmas into all these different domains or contexts. And so at the end of 2019, I did a whole talk on the XR Ethics Manifesto. In 2019, I was doing a lot of talks about privacy, trying to get a landscape of all these different aspects. And you know, this is a half hour talk where I like list all these different ethical and moral dilemmas. In this talk, this is more of a digested view of some of the big issues that come up from each of these domains. And that talk that I gave about the XR Ethics Manifesto, that was sort of a catalyst for the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Extended Reality. We started with that as a baseline. Here are some different contexts, so why not go a deep dive into these different domains? Well, that's privacy, the economic aspects, education, medical, trolling, privacy. So again, this is sort of a broad overview, and we'll be diving deep into each of these sections at this point. So I wanted to start with the resources, money, and values. So first of all, there's the access to the XR technology, which I think, you know, there's already a digital divide. And so to what degree are the immersive technologies going to continue to expand this digital divide and make it worse? Um, there's potentials to make it better, but whenever you have new emerging technologies, there's a disproportionate amount of who has access to those technologies and who's creating the experiences within this technology. So we have right now kind of an app store model within like the mobile apps with both Apple and Google. And Meta has actually taken this similar app store approach where every app that you produce has a 30% cut. So that's something that um, the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act may start to counter within the EU. There's also different dimensions of like, you know, Tim Sweeney doing a whole lawsuit to try to do this. But Meta has actually adopted a hybrid approach where they're still doing this 30% cut, but they're also doing dimensions of surveillance capitalism as we move forward, where there's all sorts of different amounts of our data that may be starting to psychographically profile us. And as they profile us, to what degree are they going to be able to have this full, robust sense of our likes, our dislikes, and who we are and our identity. So that sort of leads into this next section of the self-identity and biometric data. And so as we move forward, we're going to be combining virtual reality technologies with all sorts of different types of neurotechnologies. And so this is a picture of me with the Project Galea from OpenBCI. And so they have everything from EOG, EEG, EMG, EDA, temperature. and so. Over the long scale of VR, we're gonna to start to be integrating more and more of the sensor data. And as we have more and more of that sensor data, it's gonna have more intimate information about what's happening in our bodies and who has access to that data is gonna be a big question. And so VR has an existential threat to our privacy. Even though earlier today, Juan from Meta was saying that there's a privacy first approach, there's actually a very antiquated idea of what privacy is and how they define it as identity. But there's all this other aspect of biometric psychography, which is being defined by Britton Heller, which is all of our likes, our dislikes, our preferences. There's a huge gap where all that information about our biometric psychography data is not being covered at all in any existing law when it comes to the GDPR, where it comes to certainly in the US. So there's a huge gap that needs to be closed. So you can just get a, a sense from this uh, research from Kroger, looking at eye gaze and eye tracking data, where you can start to do all sorts of different types of inferences, whether that's your age, your biometric identity, but also your cultural background, mental health, personality traits, skills and abilities, your cognitive load, all sorts of very intimate information about what's happening in our bodies just from eye gaze alone. Well, it's not just gonna be eye gaze, it's gonna be all sorts of other information, 
it's all going to be fused together. And so part of what I've been doing is trying to start to understand what is the landscape of different types of data and what type of information you can start to extrapolate from it. So you can start to look at, say, active presence, so our behaviors, our intentions, our actions, our movements, our mental and social presence. So mental thoughts, cognitive processes, cognitive load, social presence, emotional presence, so our affective states, emotional sentiment, our facial expressions, our micro expressions. And then embodied presence, everything from our stress, our arousal, physiological reactions, eye gaze, attention, body language, muscle fatigue. So this is like the complex of all different types of data that are going to be sort of fused together to be able to psychographically profile us. And like I said, there's no existing laws that are addressing this in any capacity. And so Nita Farahani has written a book called Battle for Your Brain, where she's sort of reduced these down to three main human rights of self-determination, freedom of thought, and mental privacy. And mental privacy for her includes both the physiological reactions and the effective reactions. And uh, this is an amazing book that just came out within the last uh, couple of weeks, Battle for Your Brain, where for the last 10 years, last decade, Nita Farahani has been tracking the evolution of neurotechnologies. And it wasn't until she saw a presentation from Thomas Reardon looking at control labs and how Control Labs was acquired by Meta, and that was the catalyst for her to write this book. Because she had been tracking what was happening in the B2B space for neurotechnologies, but it wasn't until she saw this acquisition by Meta that she saw there's a pathway for some of this neurotechnologies, non-invasive neurotechnologies, to have a consumer play in the context of virtual and augmented reality. This is an amazing book, highly recommend it, and I did an extended interview with her. But she's proposing what she calls a new human right of cognitive liberty. And that includes everything from self-determination, freedom of thought, mental privacy, and that we need to start to establish this new human right at an international legal level and then have it ripple down and start to influence and change things like GDPR and influence future privacy legislation as we move forward. There's also Raphael Yusta in the Morning Star Group that is looking at the mirror rights. So you have everything from trying to define the right to mental privacy, the right to identity, the right to agency and other aspects of right to fair access to mental augmentation, the right to be protected from algorithmic bias. So I think the first three are the real key here in terms of like protecting your mental privacy. And then if you protect that, then you know, mapping of the identity. And then if you know your identity, then you can start to nudge people and start to undermine someone's agency. And so this right to agency, and that it's very similar to what Nita Farahani is doing with cognitive liberty, but slightly different. But at the end of the day, we're gonna need to have some effort at the human rights level, defining new human rights, to pass it into change GDPR, to have different aspects of redefining what biometric data means in the AI Act, and then maybe the Metaverse Initiative will be something that comes from the EU that starts to close some of these gaps that exist right now. So going back to identity, there's both the avatar and your identity that you're representing. If you're going to present and create an application, you should have a diverse selection of, av of avatars for people to see. Mike Seymour did a great job of covering some of the different threats when it comes to how AI is going to start to be able to spoof our identity, both from our representation of what we look like, but also the AI for the voice. So what's the future of identity and how to verify what our identity is as we move forward in these virtual spaces? There's a whole idea of Snapchat dysphoria from facial filters where people see an augmented version of themselves and they actually want to have plastic surgery to more closely match this virtual augmentation. And so what kind of body dysmorphia like the Snapchat dysphoria that we start to have from these different types of technologies. So moving on to early education, communication, there was some talk from Meta about education, but the problem is that none of their technologies are FERPA compliant, which is the privacy being in alignment so that there's offerings from these technologies that are going to be able to be used in educational context, but there's lots of other issues that we cover in the IEEE paper around education. There's also a minimum age of 13, uh, largely because of how the eyes are still developing, but also because of the COPA compliance with the United States. But that's a big issue in terms of what type of adult content may be available for folks who are less than 13 in these virtual spaces. And there's no age verification right now anywhere in VR to verify what someone's actual age is. Going into home, family, private property, this is also the earth. I don't have the environmental aspect here, but this previous conversation was certainly digging into how we need to be in right relationship to the earth. But when we look at the home, we look at issues like volumetric privacy. In the United States, there's the Fourth Amendment, which is protecting US citizens from unreasonable search and seizure. But there's also an interpretation of that, which is a third party doctrine, which means that whenever you give data to a third party, there's no reasonable expectation for that to remain private, which means that there's certain threats to our Fourth Amendment rights for privacy of our, our home and our volumetric spaces. And so what happens to that data? Where is it going up to the cloud? And who has access to it? Then you have Meta has talked about this idea of contextually aware AI. 
which for me I think is super problematic because there's no sort of privacy concept for how that's going to be integrated for what happens to that data. Helen Isenbaum has a contextual integrity theory of privacy, which means that there's context where there's appropriate flows of information. So if you're talking to your doctor, you're giving medical information, that's appropriate. Or if you're talking to your banker and you give financial information, that's contextually relevant. But what happens when there's an AI that's ingesting all that data and has no idea for how to navigate the contextual integrity of this information? And how do you prevent that from leaking out? So I think there's a lot of sort of fundamental problems with where this contextual aware AI is going to go. There is an example that Meta has given this episodic memory of AI, which is, where did I put grandma's watch? If we think about what that means, it means that AI is tracking all our movements, it knows where everything is in your house, and again, this is sort of this big brother dystopic vision of where they want to take AI. Meta has this project called Ego4D, and they have these challenges that are trying to set out what their future uh, from an AI research perspective is going to be, but you kind of see where they may want to take this from a product point of view, which is episodic memory, what happened when, what will I do next, what am I doing and how, who said what and when, and how are we interacting. These are all contextually aware AI big brother that's watching and trying to answer all these questions. But again, there's no aspect for how privacy is going to be incorporated into any of these answers to these questions. Okay, so moving on to entertainment, hobbies, and sex, we have escapism and addiction, which, you know, for folks that have been using the big screen beyond, I've heard a lot of folks that say, I just was in VR for 10 or 12 hours and I thought it was just a few hours. And so we have this ability of this deep immersion, people really getting lost into these experiences. And what happens when you have like the candy crush of VR that is really trying to like hack people to spend more and more time in VR because it's profitable for them. What are the implications for making sure that people are able to maintain a balance and be in right relationship to the world around them and make sure they're not sort of escaping into these virtual worlds? Then you have adult content in the context of that there's no age verification. And so you have things like child predators in VR chat that may be trying to prey on minors or you know what happens when they're in these 18 plus worlds, but again, there's no verification of how old they actually are. And so in terms of this sort of adult content in virtual spaces, and move on to medical health. Um, so say to the baseline, if you're designing a, a VR experience, you need to make sure that you're not making people sick, but there's all sorts of other things in terms of epilepsy or derealization, depersonalization. There's all these things in which when you're designing these experiences, you may be triggering a physiological medical reactions in folks. And so there needs to be an awareness of what those triggers are, how to disclose what those triggers might be, if there's flashing lights or whatnot, but also to have lots of different locomotion options so that people have a variety of different ways to move through your space without you forcing them into something that's going to make them motion sick. Skip Rizzo is doing a lot of amazing work with VR exposure therapy for PTSD. And if there's experiences that can help people to resolve and heal from their PTSD. There's also a capability for immersive experiences to cause PTSD. And so how do you do trauma triggers or trauma warnings or being aware of what the spectrum of trauma is and so that you're not creating trauma in folks that are seeing your experiences. All right, other partnerships. There's been a lot of debate around VR as an empathy machine. I think there's a certain degree, which certainly there's a lot of legitimate uses for building empathy just from any medium, from film or radio and also VR. But there's also potentially problematic aspects of to what degree are people that are being focused on, do they have authorship or control over what stories are being told? But also, to what degree can you actually empathize with someone who's a Syrian refugee? And is that something that is more along the lines of sympathy rather than empathy? Virtual harassment and bullying is something that has certainly been a part within these virtual spaces. And so trying to create code of conduct and moderation and ways to block people, have a personal space bubbles from a technological perspective, but just understanding that there's this intersectional axis of privilege, domination, and oppression. And it's these folks who are marginalized communities of you know, women, people of color, LGBTQ plus IA. So these are all the folks that are on the bottom half here receiving a lot of the oppression. These are the people that need to be listened to in terms of to what degree are these places safe? Are there proper ways of reporting things? And really building a larger infrastructure, not only technologically, but also coming up with a cultural code of conduct and enforcement to make sure that we create these safe online spaces. Okay, so there's death, collective resources. There's a lot of virtual violence that are happening in these virtual spaces. There's a lot of debates over time in terms of like 2D violence within video games does not create any sort of correlation to violence in the real world or physical world. But what about these virtual spaces where you're having embodied interactions, where you're having these death simulators, and to what degree is that impacting people in a subtle ethical or moral or physiological way? And then you have philosophy, higher education, law. So again, this is the human rights laws and regulations. And so 
to what degree are we going to have this global jurisdiction of the metaverse where there is certain laws that are kind of beyond any jurisdiction of regionally? And how do you manage all of those different aspects of different behaviors as we move forward in the metaverse? And so I think this is, you know, with the EU and the metaverse of form, maybe a little start to address that. There's a whole Stanford Cyber Policy Center. They had a existing law and extended reality symposium. That was a whole exploration of that. Did a series of interviews about that. But I think that as we think about this, how does the regulatory regime transfer over to what happens into these virtual spaces in the metaverse. Okay, so career government institutions. So these are all the different ways in which that um, you can use the different technology in the workplace, but also what happens when you have your employer who wants to start to monitor your focus, your cognitive load, all these new technologies. And you know, if your employer is asking to have access to the data to kind of do this neurological micromanaging of what your attention is from moment to moment, there's a real transgression of boundary and there's not a lot of clear regulations for how to manage that as we move forward. And this is something that Nita Farahani covers quite extensively in her book, Battle for Your Brain, which I recommend again, checking out to get a lot more details for how this could be going down a dark path. We also have governmental mass surveillance with not only the China and the CCP for you know all this information that's coming in, which you know you have ByteDance, which owns Pico, which what happens to all the data that comes through these headsets, but you also have Meta that have some of that information that ends up in the hands of the US government. And so, you know, there's certain ways that there was a data transfer between the EU and the US that was disrupted because of not being able to ensure that it wasn't going to end up in the hands of US intelligence agencies. And so there's a real concern around to what degree are authoritarian governments going to be misusing different types of data to bring about more oppression to their population. Okay, so friends, community, collective culture. There's a lot of importance for making sure that we have proper diversity, equity, inclusion, not only in the content that we're producing, but who's producing that content and who's involved in producing the platforms that we're producing, making sure that we're not just creating technology that's for one subsection of cisgender white males, uh, making sure that there's ways of including all the concerns of diverse range of people and interests as we not only build the technology, but also build the content. Algorithmic bias is uh, certainly a huge issue that you know, was brought up with the NeuroRights Initiative, but in terms of philosophically, there's a lot of kind of utilitarian thinking sometimes when we create technology where we think, oh, well, this works for 95% of the people, but a lot of times the 5% that it doesn't work for actually is the same sort of marginalized communities where you're amplifying different aspects of systemic racism or sexism or bias and amplifying it at a systemic scale. And so to what degree are these immersive technologies going to be propagating that type of algorithm bias? Coded Bias is a great film to be able to get more information, specifically in the context of facial tracking. And the, the last one is accessibility. And there's, on the one hand, there's gonna be a lot of assistive technologies for XR, but there's also, as we move forward, not really considering the true concerns of accessibility when it comes to how to make these technologies truly accessible for people who may not have all the able-bodied capacities of sight or hearing. So making sure as we move forward to, again, make sure that we're as accessible as we possibly can. And then, again, there's a whole IEEE paper written on this, but still yet a lot of work to be done on this area. So that was a, a whirlwind tour of all the sort of ethical moral dilemmas. You know, I did a talk at South by Southwest where I was talking about the ultimate potential of more of the exalted potentials, but also perils on each of this. And so, again, you can check out my slides here on SlideShare if you want to get more information. And also in the Voices of VR podcast, I feature lots of different series on these different topics, and you can get a little bit more information in the footnotes that are in the slides to be able to go to both episodes, but also other resources to get more information. So with that, thanks again for listening.